Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, as written here, I'm Jürgen Bock from the Mamao School of Visual Arts in Portugal, Lisbon. And this is the opening of two events, of one of two events organized by the Mamao in the framework of this conference. And I would like to thank all the partners that Mamao has been the great pleasure of working with over the last two years. During this time, we have jointly organized a range of artist residencies, seminars in Lisbon, Istanbul, Beirut and Kiel, as well as exhibitions and publications. And I'm also very pleased that a lot of artists are also here, which I had the pleasure of working with in Lisbon. To a certain extent, this conference marks the end of this collaboration, opening the way for future projects, which will bring some of us together and also involve new partners. The topics proposed by Mamash for today, the panel about to start, and this evening program were developed following detailed discussions with radios of art, Heinrich Böll Foundation Schleswig-Holstein and the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin, in close collaboration with the Allianz Cultural Foundation. I would like to take this opportunity to thank these organizations for their trust and for the enthusiasm which, with which they responded to our proposals. One of the main topics of this Congress is the discussion of public art. Other events organized by our dear colleagues will be the essential and possible contribution of art to the culture of the public realm and art in public space, democracy and participation. The title of this panel discussion uh, art in public space, art as public space, and art in the public interest is borrowed from an essay written by the American art theorist Myung Kwon in 1997, in which he explored the contradictory constraint under which public art programs have to operate. Different modes of fostering meaning with regards to art in public space, as public space, and in the public interest, or new public art as it was called in 97, will be presented and discussed by the three speakers from different angles. I'd like to uh, introduce Gertrud Sandquist, who kindly will moderate the panel and be also somehow in respondee. Gertrud Sandquist is a dean of the Malmö Art Academy and a professor in the theory and history uh, of ideas of visual art at the Lund University. She is one of the founding members of the European Art Research Network and was a member of the jury of the DAD Berliner Künstlerprogramm. She co-curated the Modern Ausstellung at the Moderne Museet Stockholm in 2010 and the Gothenburg Biennial of Contemporary Art in 2011. Gertrude Sandkus has written numerous texts on contemporary art. Thank you very much, Gertrude, Jimmy, Helmut and Ray, to be on that panel, and I'd like to give the floor to Gertrude Sandkus. Thank you very much for everybody being here. Hello? Yes. Many thanks to my dear old friend and collaborator, Jürgen Bock. Uh, we have been working together since seven years, actually. And uh, it's my uh, pleasure now mainly to listen and to introduce these prominent speakers. It's only one thing I thought upon this morning, and that was um, I started to think upon Giordano Bruno, you know, this old monk and visionary from the 16th century. He stated that uh, in order to get knowledge about the universe, there are four equally important roads. It's art, love, mathematics, and magic. And uh, he was burnt, as you know, as a <laughs> heretic, 1600. Maybe times are changing. So... Hopefully we'll be able to talk about this in a more civilized way nowadays. Uh, first, I would like to introduce, and I feel almost uh, ashamed introducing for a German audience such a prolific thinker as Helmut Traxler, who, of course, everybody knows. Uh, but uh, only to give you some brief update, he was director of the Munich Kunstverein between 92 and 95, and since 99 teaching aesthetic theory at the Merz Academy in Stuttgart. And he has also been uh, writing extensively on the topic. So please, Helmut, if you would like to start. Okay, thank you very much for uh, your Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> now it's working, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Jürgen. Thank you, Gertrud, for 
the invitation um, and the opportunity to speak here. What I will offer you is a little bit a less optimistic view of things uh, as we have heard in the morning. And I hope I can, you know, make my argument convincing for you without taking you, you know, the fun on uh, the topic. <laughs> so, but you have to decide. Um, yeah, as a cultural theorist and an art critic, I grew up uh, within the context of those discussions about modernism and avant-garde. And um, seen from that background, the claims of this conference uh, sound a little bit strange for me. Because there has always been a serious conflict between what artists were doing and the public interest. Remember all the scandals of the avant-garde, the avant-garde was provoking, uh, and so on and so forth. So to envision art as a positive means uh, for the public good or in the service of social transformation as a form of creative politicization in order to foster civil society uh, uh, seems to me, I have to admit, quite suspicious. Uh, suspicious because it contains an, you know, idealist assumption what art, you know, big art is supposed to be about. Um, this approach, however, is not specific to this conference. Uh, it can be found as a legitimizing narrative in the meantime all over the place within the global biennial festival or, or project cultures. And, of course, we are all ambiguously involved into those structures on many levels, discursive, organizational, political, financial, uh, and aesthetic uh, as well. Yeah? I myself have used those categories I'm criticizing now for many times, yeah? I have to admit. Yeah? And I feel very sympathetic, actually, with the political art movements who have developed the key elements of that discursive formation yeah, since the 1970s. However, what irritates me is a new constellation of those elements indicating not so much a metaphorical potential but a feasibility on a very pragmatic level turning everything sort of yeah, into a question of uh, radical management yeah, as we were discussing that yesterday. What sounds so disturbing for me about that is precisely the absence of conflict on a structural level. Everything ends up as a question of the goodwill of us as individuals here, yeah, that we all, you know, uh, intend the, the good, but we have to cope this with the evil. Yeah? It seems as an underlying assumption that there is a deep homogeneity or similarity between, for example, the artistic endeavors on the one hand, political activism and methods of bureaucratic organization on the other, all motivated by the same moral obsessions, and oriented towards the same greater political goals. However, such an assumption about art and about organizational politics is without any doubt far from expressing some kind of natural order. Yeah? That is, is given that we have art here and politics and everything can be, you know, paralyzed. Uh, but this idea is a very historical, yeah, a historically very specific assumption. And I would call it a typically pre-avant-garde uh, bourgeois kind of narrative, yeah, pre-1848 even, if we want to go into the deep <laughs> historical space here. Yeah? Uh, not only the idea of art as a morally useful tool which could be positioned against the increasing social disease by some sort of aesthetic education is part of that narrative, but also the ideas of social transformation, the coming of a global civil society, and even the public themselves. Uh, far from representing such just unquestionable values of humanity, they are hegemonic categories loaded heavily with implicit assumptions about power, social difference, and self-assertion. The civic, for example, cannot be conceived without its counterterm, the barbaric, uh, and it has its deep historical roots in Greek culture, and uh, especially when in the early, you know, 17th, 16th, 17th century. And that means uh, civilization can finally not be achieved because it keeps being dependent on some barbaric adversary, at least on a rhetorical level, which always will be reproduced with one's own rhetorics, yeah, with one's own arguments. So if I say, you know, this is civilized, then I always need the bar barbarian, you know, as a, as a background figure yeah, to, uh, to, to project my 
my ideas. But also the concept of social transformation as well is not only deeply infected by the difference between static and dynamic cultures, but also by concepts of, you know, development, uneven developments, and therefore very clearly, you know, articulated uh, social hierarchies. And the public seems a highly imaginary and such holistic category altogether. So it's not just the good, the, the public. Yeah? Uh, it's not, we cannot conceive concepts like this without any political context yeah? and content. So, of course, I cannot discuss all those issues here in detail, you know, uh, and I don't make all the necessary references for my arguments here, <laughs> which would be... Uh, Probably it's not necessary in this context. Uh, my point is only to stress the inherent difficulties on the theoretical as well as on the political level and to reject the idea of art as a highly ideologized concept to overcome those differences. That's my point. Yeah? Um, so instead of instrumentalizing said in a crude way, art for whatever good reasons. I think art, artistic practices and art exhibitions are way more interesting when they succeed in articulating difficulties, conflicts and antagonisms inherent to moral, political, organizational, pedagogical and finally aesthetic claims. In general, I like artists more as troublemakers than as problem solvers, more as weirdos than as perfect administrators, academics, or activists. But of course, there has to be a connection between a problem and the trouble you make around it, because if you produce only your very individual troubles, that is also getting boring pretty soon, yeah? as we know from the art market yeah? very well. Yeah? Um, so the challenge for artists and mediators alike will be to articulate the problem in a way which neither solves the problem nor makes it disappear behind idealist cliches about art, politics, and the public good. As an example, I briefly want to talk about the show which I saw by chance in Cologne last weekend. It concerned and still concerns most of the issues we are discussing here uh, without really articulating them explicitly. The show is called Before the Law. It is you know, Germany's maybe most uh, prominent curator, Kaspar Koenig's uh, last exhibition as director of uh, Museum Ludwig, and Jimmy Durham has a big, uh, uh, significant and very impressive installation in it. Uh, what is interesting about which show is indicated in its subtitle for me yeah, and for my argument here. I mean, it has lots of dimensions, of course. And the sub subtitle uh, is Sculptures of a Post-War Era and Spaces of Contemporary Art. It is precisely this relation between the sculptures of the 1950s and contemporary art practices, practices which is so revealing. The sculptures of a post-war era were made for a still, you know, uniform urban public, public urban space. Yeah? Uh, those sculptures, um, and how, however, you know, imagined that space might have been. Within the museum, those sculptures appear as if just being here for a visit. Yeah? They just come in, you know, make their poses, whatever, uh, they represent themselves, you know, within the museum as public representatives, yeah? They know they belong outside, yeah, at the square in the city or many places, yeah? That's not, the museum is not their natural environment, yeah? It's public space. space. In so doing, they inherit the old pre-modern idea of a representative public sphere and transform that idea onto the level of bourgeois representation, which means individually expressing universal ways of existence, codes of you know, ex existential sufferings, and the like. Yeah? So famous Zadkins, uh, Rotterdam uh, sculpture, you know, the figure expressing, uh, individually expressing you know, the, the suffering of the war. So the rooms uh, for contemporary art, by contrast, are explicitly made for the museum space. There are no sculptures anymore, and they are not just for a visit here, but they are here permanently. Uh, and um, 
but yeah, there are no sculptures, but installations embracing very different kinds of material, different kinds of conceptual framework, different kinds of political ambition. They also do very different things in articulating critique against sexism, racism, or capitalism, and they do this in a variety of different artistic or aesthetic ways. But they all share the limiting framework of a given institutional setting, the museum's architectonical and financial conditions. That means those installations they, they are claiming some sort of relevance yeah, and uh, responsibility for the outside, which can only be articul articulated from the inside of a museum. Yeah. So the comparison with the sculptures of the 1950s makes immediately clear what sort of you know, natural environment the museum space has become for contemporary art. And at the same time, how confused the idea of a public sphere beyond the museum has become in the meantime as well. There's no simple way out of a museum anymore. Yeah? It's not just we go public, uh, you know, indoor spaces and urban outdoor spaces and private and public spheres, those are totally different registers. They don't match, yeah? so they interfere in many ways. And that is what, and this interference is precisely what has changed, yeah? not that, that it's just we've lost public space or so. Hmm? You, you might object that there is still, you know, other art uh, which is not in this museum and it's still happening outside um, on the street uh, and that there are performative and activist imperatives which directly aim at the public realm. But I have my doubts if they really articulate a general public interest either. Mm. To bet better understand those doubts, it might be helpful to use that comparison between public sculptures of the 50s and contemporary museum installations the Cologne Show is offering so explicitly in order to ask for the specific differences and the historical changes which have taken place um, to, in order yeah, to be able to address the problems yeah, more specifically. And uh, I have only three more short points, yeah? So, first of all, as I indicated already, the idea of a public sphere seems to have changed. Not that it has simply eroded from some ideal form, yeah, as the critical theory, you know, is not getting tired from repeating over and over again. Um, already in the 1950s, it has been highly imaginative, yeah, this idea of a public sphere. We should not forget that urban space, media space, and institutional space were already quite distinct at that time. So we had television and radio and, and so on and so forth, yeah, and of course museums, and not in the scale we are now facing, but, but, mm -hmm. But the public sphere still in the 50s could uh, be conceived as a unifying categories, category for institutional media and urban spaces. Um, and, um, and this category could be addressed in those static, sculptural, you know, individually expressive uh, metaphors yeah, and universal metaphors, that's also important. And today, urban media and institutional spaces seem to be so divided from each other that the idea of a unifying public sphere seems to be a more romantic fantasy. They have, you know, split apart in many ways, I would say. And although there is so much art around, for example, uh, in the world so much more art than maybe ever yeah, was produced in the moment, there's very little actually in the urban space uh, anymore, less than in the 50s. Yeah? If you walk around in the you know, former eastern uh, Berlin part of uh, town, you, you can see you know, lots and lots of uh, urban, uh, public urban sculptures standing around. Um, and, of course, there's even less in the, in the media space. Yeah? It's almost, at least in, in our understanding of you know, what, what art means, uh, it's extremely little to be seen there. Um, so the different sorts of social spaces um, seem to have differentiated and professionalized each according to its own criteria. Mm -hmm. And the disturbing moment is that, you know, the media would also, they are also producing their own kind of art, you know, as pop culture, as design, urban space is full of, you know, art. It depends on what we consider to be art, you know, if we 
this considered street design not as art when it is in a certain way our you know historical decision not to do so uh, but of course there is art out there yeah so it it brings up a lot of you know questions about you know what the category of art really means in, in what sense and it makes also clear that it is the museum which is defining very clearly and our you know discursive uh, endeavors uh, here uh, so to say um, they are also involved in defining precisely that difference mm -hmm. so it clearly means that there is you know uh, does not mean that there is no public anymore yeah um, the museum even has become a highly public enterprise, yeah, a, mach a publicity machine yeah, all around the world. Uh, think about Guggenheim or whatever. Um, but it's the museum's public and not the media's public or the urban public. And, of course, there are intersections yeah, on limited uh, scale, but there is clearly no common denominator anymore, no common, you know, f uh, fantasy about uh, public unity. So also the urban public is not the real public anymore. Yeah? You could see that in Berlin, for example, with the, with the Occupy uh, movement, that it was so difficult to find a place, yeah, a, a space where it could produce any kind of, of meaning yeah, which uh, would infect the urban, yeah, Berlin urban space. Yeah? So it was easier in other cities, yeah? but here it was extremely difficult, and it shows the problem how, you know, that it's not just urban space and just going out and uh, going to the demonstration, that, uh, that those are also historically very specific political forms which don't work in that way anymore. Um, uh, so also the street and the, the urban space uh, defines, in my opinion, more you know, the desire for the real uh, than really the, a, a, a space as a unifying public category. Um, and the real problem is that all those segments have their own ideas and produce more and more their own ideas about art, politics, uh, and the public uh, without uh, an integ integrative perspective anymore. And I think this is the, the really crucial problem for me. So this is for, was first for the public, but secondly, also the idea of art has changed dramatically since the 1950s. It is especially the discourse of expansion coming up in the 1960s, 60s, initiated, initiated mainly with the minimalist movement in the early 1960s, which tried to make the artistic practice and the artistic work itself public. Yeah? So the idea of public art is very, I mean, of course, it has uh, many different uh, historical you know, lines which, which would be necessary to follow. But it is a decisive, yeah, what Hal Foster called the minimalist crux. Yeah? Uh, it is a decisive moment in one way or another. And for example, so uh, art is not considered to be just a private act of self-expression anymore with a universal existential meaning, uh, but that it is creating a public, a participatory proposition. Mm -hmm. um, and as an example, I can uh, uh, Name, you know, for example, famous Carl Andre, minimalist sculpture, who more or less what he did was reducing the, the traditional plinth, yeah, for where the sculpture was positioned upon, uh, to the floor, yeah, as a, in arranging uh, plates on the floor you could, as a visitor, stand on, yeah, you could enter the artwork, yeah, you could become part of the artwork, the sculpture itself, in a certain way. Um, from here, the idea could be developed that art could and should be capable to contribute to the emergence of a public. Yeah? It was constructing its own public, so to say, uh, to contribute to the, to, to the yeah, development of civil society, of sustainability, and all the categories we want to discuss here. The problem is precisely that with expansive ideas, uh, they need the limited space of a museum. Uh, to make sense. Yeah? Uh, so if you have uh, Andre's plates lying outside in urban space or if you make a media image, that doesn't really work. Yeah? It, doesn't work. it works precisely within that space. Um, and that means uh, art became public, but public in a new sense as a limited public, 
uh, it points also to the problematic of a participatory, because also the participatory is always defined from a certain perspective, and therefore reproduces the hierarchies it actually wants to overcome. Yeah? Famous, uh, you know, sentence by Joseph Beuys: saying, "Everyone is an artist." Yeah, but I'm Joseph Beuys. Tell you that you are an artist. Yeah, and it's not you yourself. Yeah, uh, so that's the, the, the crucial problem in participation. Yeah, it defines the roles: uh, who is allowed to participate and who is, you know, setting up the stakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, thirdly, of course, it's the you know, geographical framework that has changed, at least as uh, dramatically as art and uh, the public ideas of the public have changed. The emergence of a globally active art world since the 1980s, I'm not sure if we could call it an expansion yeah, um, of a classically Western art world, um, has been setting up a completely new frame of references for the ideas of art. Yeah? Uh, so there are totally uh, or many new uh, ways of thinking about art uh, coming up, uh, which cannot be unified under one, you know, uh, again, he hegemonic idea, uh, especially this very specific uh, Western modern idea of art, which was established uh, in, in the 18th century. Uh, so and the interesting point here, this is, of course, in this context, not, not, not so necessary to <laughs> to um, develop further. Um, but what is interesting is that this old idea of the world art, yeah, which uh, had, you know, was uh, uh, triumphantly you know, embraced in the 1950s, yeah? uh, abstraction as a new world language and things like that, they have been revitalized in a certain way, and we also can find them still within you know, political art discourses. And that is, I think, a disturbing moment here. Um, and that it is precisely that uh, those universal, you know, uh, approaches and fantasies, they seem to, to miss the point, what is at stake at the, the whole, you know, topic of globalization. Because there is clearly no new harmony uh, to be seen at the, you know, horizon. Uh, global art instead is producing and reproducing fractions and conflicts in very new ways f and far beyond the old opposites between, you know, us and them, the West and the rest and, and sorts like that. And so it's precisely about what kind of, you know, new uh, uh, relations, new fractions, new conflicts are coming up, and that precisely will be the challenge. Yeah, to come to an end uh, and to, uh, again, to, uh, to um, relate the problems to the, to the troubles, yeah, as I uh, try to... to uh, argue for. Uh, so the problems, I think, are very clear. Yeah? So there is no unifying public sphere, yeah? good or interest, but only fragmented, highly autonomous social spheres. Yeah? I think we have to count with that, and we can't overcome that in you know, idealistic uh, speculation. And there is no re new real public art. Art still remains a very private, subjective, and highly privileged form of cultural articulation. And I also see no way to overcome that by, you know, intentional, uh, good-willing way of, you know, over jumping over the, over the gap yeah, of the problem. And, of course, there's no unified global art world, you know, promoting some global art, whatever, in the name of civil society, uh, but very different antagonistic subject positions which cannot be Reconciled. Yeah? Of course, I'm focusing here on the more negative sides, and there could also be a lot said about what positively is possible, but I think this is happening anyhow here in this context, and that is why, you know, I, I go more on, <laughs> on this side. Yeah, the, the trouble recite, resulting from that diagnosis uh, is very, for me, very clear that art is not the solution, but will continuously remain itself also part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is at least uh, co-producing those fragmentations, subjectivities, uh, privileges, uh, all those problems yeah, its idealistic interpretations always want to overcome. Um, but those problems are precisely the conditions for its very existence. Art is a problematic enterprise in the strict sense. And to address uh, those conditions, I would say, 
uh, or I consider as a precondition for art becoming political. And this is where usually the trouble begins. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Helmut. Really thought-provoking and interesting. And uh, I think that maybe we could talk about this later. You seem to suggest that the public space uh, is, if not collapsed, at least almost gone. And that means not only that it has drastic consequences for art or public art, but it also means that it has specific consequences for politics. And I hope we will be able to talk about this a little bit mm -hmm. later on. But first, I would like to – I have a very easy job today because everybody I introduce are extremely well-known. <laughs> and uh, my dear friend, former colleague, Jimmy Durham, is absolutely no exception from this. Um, Jimmy is, um, as you know, uh, one of the most prominent artists today. I cannot – it's easy to tell which big – documentas and biennials you haven't participated in than the other way around. So I leave that. But what we maybe don't know always about is that you have been working with theater, performance, literature in the U.S., and you have been a very, very active member in civil rights movements and uh, uh, being an organizer in the American Indian movement. Um, and... You were also the director of the International Indian Treaty Council and representative of the United Nations. Um, I remember first time you came to our school and you had this wonderful talk where you were saying that uh, the society, they, as you said, <laughs> needed uh, women, artists and savages to be outside of the society for keeping up the image of the society. And I have no clue what you will talk about now, but I have never forgotten those words. <laughs> so please, Jimmy. Thank you. Hello. What I want to try to say, Helmut Draxler already said better, so maybe I don't have to say anything. I should have brought some photos, and now see, because, well, maybe I've lost them. But I had some photos of street performances I did in 69 and 70 when I lived in Geneva. We didn't know what performance was. We didn't know the word yet. And I was just trying to see what to do with art, with sculpture. You make it, and then what do you do? I was lucky living in Geneva. There were no galleries in Geneva. So there wasn't a choice that you might put the works in a gallery and sell them. So I, I put a lot of them on wheels, and I drug them down the street, and I threw others in the river with the rope on them and pulled them back after they had a nice swim. And my idea was to make people look and wonder what they were looking at, and nothing more than that. In the 70s, I, I left Geneva and I went to South Dakota, and in the American Indian Movement we started survival schools, we call them, for our own children, but also for adults. And we tried to teach what things we knew at the same time as we tried to unteach what the state was telling our children. And one of the more obscene works of public art is in the state of South Dakota, and it's... Uh, They've, they've used dynamite and things to blast out a beautiful mountainside in the Pahasapa, and they call it Mount Rushmore. And uh, we have, we're under this uh, Mount Rushmore. We taught uh, 
things that had the sign of Indianness, like beadwork and uh, leather making and these sorts of things. But we also taught shoplifting. In every single school, we taught shoplifting. And there were field trips of how to appropriately <laughs> shoplift. <laughs> and the simple reason is we're quite poor, especially if you're in a city like uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, or Fort Worth or something, and then you get arrested. So we tried to teach people how not to get arrested when they're shoplifting. And we were pretty good at it. In the 1980s, Maria Teresa Alves and I moved to Mexico. And we tried to start a school. We lived in a very poor neighborhood of the city of Cuernavaca. And we tried to start a school with local people, mostly children. But we had one young woman who was a prostitute. We weren't trying to teach anything in the school. We were trying to see how we could make a space that... Uh, we might all figure out how to make things. And these were local Indian children. I had about uh, 10 or 12. And they lived on the other side of the barranca from us in a squatter's camp. They didn't have houses or anything. So the school finally closed up because the poor people in our neighborhood beat the children up and didn't let them come back and the prostitute disappeared because our neighborhood was not quite so poor and we didn't want these poor people <laughs> messing us up. Between those two times, Maria Trace and I lived in Manhattan and she is from Brazil, and she had no green card and no U.S. passport. So every day she would have to stand in a great big long line to apply once again for a green card every single day. And you couldn't get out of line. You couldn't let someone else stand in line for you. And it was an all-day affair, day after day after day. And then you get up to some bureaucrat who's very rude. And then you go out the back door, and you see a great big piece of iron that's trying to hold you in. And it's called Tilted Ark by Richard Serra. So a lot of people didn't want this thing there. I was <laughs> I was running an organization called the Foundation for the Community of Artists, and we tried to imagine that there might be a community of artists. And all the other artists started this petition to protect Sarah's tilted arch. But Maria Trace and I were on the side of the non-artist, and we wanted it moved right away, maybe into the middle of the, what's that, River Hudson River. <laughs> <laughs> we thought that might be more appropriate. I think it was finally moved. But it, it made me think once more about... Uh, public art. The two words are quite strange because we never did really know who the public was, even now or at any time. And we don't know what art is, and we never did know what art was. So it's kind of funny. But if you imagine one thing, if you imagine public art, you then have to, what, imagine private art? Is there public art and private art? If you make a bronze statue of a man on a horse, 
and put it in your city, no one asks if this is art or not. You just know that it's kind of in the art world. Oh yeah, this is a guy on a horse. This is in the. This is in the. It certainly is public, and it certainly is kind of. You might say kind of in the art system, the same way that uh, bad paintings are in the art system. We know they're not art, but we say they're art because they're paintings. And we put them in the museum. The Prado is full of these monstrosities. <laughs> what happens next is not a man on a horse, but Richard Serra. And that doesn't happen to the city. That happens in a strange context as Drexler has been saying. I don't know who put the man on a horse in the city. The city fathers, the city put the man on a horse in a city. And he might have been an insulting man to a lot of people, but the man on the horse-ness, the man on the horse-ness as a, public thing is not so depressing to most people unless he killed your mother or something then you're, you're bothered by it but we have no way to be public now and we have no way to consult the public if I want to put art on the street if I want to put art out in the city I have no way of talking to the public about it, of asking the public, do you, do you want this tilted arc? <laughs> do you want this thing that I'm making? There is no public to ask, and there's no way of asking the public about it. And this thing is made only for that, only for putting out there in the public as art, which is a little strange, isn't it? It's kind of negates itself in the first instance, it seems to me. Every artist now dreams of making some public art because it's a lot more money than private art unless you're at the top of the top and make a diamond-encrusted skull or something. I've been quite lucky in my life always, I suppose. People often ask me, Two silly questions. When did you realize you were an artist and when did you get to where you could support yourself as art? I thought I could support myself making art when I was 60 years old. But then I made a little extra money and I sunk it into a film that didn't make any money. And then I had to go to work again and Gertrude hired me and... (laughs) This is a strange business. I never, I never had the privilege of thinking that art was my profession. It wasn't my job. It wasn't the way I made my money. My way of making money was anything that came along. Any way I could make money, I made money, including selling art. <laughs> but I didn't think that was my job. I grew up thinking uh, that everything we did was for our liberation, the liberation of our people. Everything we did was for that. 
including the making of art. It sounds kind of corny now in this century to talk about liberation, but it's not really very corny. We still need liberating. And I think we, in Europe, need a kind of way to to have art and to have public that is away from money, is away from the professionalism of art. I want all artists to get rich and successful. I'm not against uh, money, but these things are separate things. And we know it very well when we talk about music or when we talk about uh, literature. We know that uh, the writers that we like, Heinrich Bull, for example, wasn't trying to become a millionaire best-selling writer. And it's not, it's not even a category for writing. It's a category for bad writing. We know when we say, when we read the New York Times saying bestseller, number one bestseller, we know it's probably trash, don't we? We know it's a, a mystery novel or this or that or the other. We know the writer is doing it for money. We know it's not serious. We know that uh, a composer of music these days, or even just a player of music, is not necessarily the rock and roll star. I'm not against rock and roll stars. I don't like any of their music, but I could. I like it, I suppose, if it was better music. The serious musician, the composer or the player, is not famous, doesn't want to be famous necessarily. I mean, that's not a goal. To be rich and famous is would be silly. You would, everyone would say, this is kind of silly. But we take it as the thing for art. as, And this is what I said in Gertrude's school. We are taught that the only goals for making art, the only measurable success for art, is fame and fortune. And we're taught that from childhood, basically. You, When you're a child and you're artistic, that means you can draw your mother gives you a little local fame and puts your drawing on the refrigerator. And this is your reward. You get the little fame. If, if the artist can't be a little more serious, the city fathers have no reason to be different, do they? <laughs> are the city mothers in the case of some cities. I think we really have lost a public as a thing these days just because the world has changed. So if I, as an artist, want to take myself a little seriously and take my endeavor to make art a little seriously... I want to make it for the smartest people. I want to make my art for the smartest people. I don't know these people. They're not the most educated people. They can be anyone on the street. I don't know them. I want to know them. If I don't do that, I make art for my friends. This is just like we all go to a bar and we drink and we jabber and we have fun 
and we come home and we knew that was what was going to happen. We knew that we're not going to do anything more than that. We go to the bar to bond in this friendship thing. We're a gang of animals when we do that. It's nice, and I'm not against it. But it's not what we want from something a little better. The public is controlled by strange capitalism, controlled by money as it tries to control us as artists, tries to say, this is your reward, fame and fortune is your reward. By the same token, everything that happens in this money society is immediately controlled and bought and made famous or not famous and is for consumption by consumers. So as usual, I want to say my words to the art world part of the world more than to the public world. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you very much, Jimmy. Again, this question of what the public, what is the public, and I'm I was thinking on George W. Bush when he immediately after September 11th, his, what he was saying to the American citizens was that they should immediately consume more <laughs> because that would be the only way to get the society going against the terrorists. Um, but now we are going to have the last um, participation on this session. Uh, it's Ray McKenzie. He is research fellow in the Forum from Critical Inquiry at Glasgow School of Art. And uh, what he doesn't know about sculpture in Scotland, public sculpture in Scotland, is not worth knowing. So, please. <laughs> I think sometimes even what I do know is not worth knowing as well. Um, good morning. Uh, no, good afternoon. My name is Herren. And I say that with a certain amount of uh, deliberate irony. Um, I I want to get down to the kind of meat of my presentation without too many preliminaries because I know that we're very pressed for time. Uh, But I want to say two things. Firstly, um, I I want to accept my my gratitude to the Heinrich Böll Foundation for inviting me to this conference and also for the great privilege that's been given to me of being able to address you in in English. Uh, It's one one of the I suppose more benign legacies of the British Empire that I can go anywhere in the world and and, 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 uh, speak to an international audience audience without leaving the comfort zone of my own mother tongue. It's a privilege I haven't earned for myself, and I'm very aware of my good fortune in this regard. Uh, The second observation is that uh, I've been given, I'm very aware that I've been given um, what we in the UK refer to as the graveyard slot, that is to say the last presentation before lunch, when uh, uh, being being brief is actually very, people are starting to leave already, so uh, we will get down to it. Um, Okay, what I'm going to take as my starting point, um, let me, how do I work this, is it this one to go? On there? Yeah, so that's the title of my public art uh, practice of view from Scotland. I'm going to take as my starting point uh, the reference in the conference documentation to this idea of art as discursive practice um, in the city, and I'm going to show a few examples from Scotland uh, that, that fall into that category. In the process, I'm going to try and catch as many of the other kind of subsidiary points referred to there, not least uh, the reference to Walter Benjamin and his, his remark about the tension between the political content of work of art and um, its aesthetic quality um, or otherwise. Now, um, anybody that um, has been involved in either the uh, practice or the critical debate about public art over the last 40 years or so um, will know um, that there's been an extraordinary proliferation of what I see as very, very good new practices that have happened in that time and some pretty remarkable achievements uh, racked up in that period as well. Um, For the sake of argument, I'm going to take 1972 as the year zero of public art practice, as we, of contemporary public art practice. Um, this was the year when Lawrence Alloway uh, wrote his very, very, in, at least in the UK, 
UK, very influential essay, The Public Sculpture Problem, where he tried to figure out not only was why so much or virtually all public art in Britain at that time was so god-awful, but also why it was apparently held in such a universal contempt by the very public for whose benefit it was ostensibly um, being made. Now, every city uh, over the world, um, I think, can um, cite their own examples of what we call plop sculpture or clip-on decorative appendages to buildings. This is what modernism um, came up with as an alternative to the grand tradition of monument making um, that uh, Lawrence Alloway had been killed off in the early part of the 20th century and modernism taken over. Is this, if this is what modernism had to offer in its place, no wonder it was perceived as a failure. As I say, things have moved on a lot since those days and uh, a lot of innovative new, new projects. These are just a few um, crude bullet points here to remind you of things you already know. Um, some of the new kinds of thinking that entered the discourse of public art in the 80s and uh, 90s. Uh, obviously the foundational concept is site specificity. The most liberating insight, I think, the idea that if you're going to put a work in the public, you've got to say something about the place um, itself. This was connected to an extraordinary proliferation of very, very good theoretical writing about the concept of place itself. Much, much more sophisticated idea of what it means to be a place or to be in a place, and this very much informed the practice of public art at that time. Absorbing those things and having a responsibility to the place was very, very different from these studio artists who simply parachuted their work into whatever space was available um, in the city. Um, there's been a, 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 another important strand has been a challenge to the idea of the monumental um, tradition in some places. I'm thinking particularly in Germany, a reinvention of the notion of the monumental with the concept of the anti-monument, and that has been a very, very um, liberating idea as well. Probably the most radical of all was the idea that a work of art doesn't need to be an object. It can be a process, it can be an intervention um, in time. So the dissolution of the object, obviously referring back to Boise's great concept of social sculpture leading on to new genre public art and more recently relational um, aesthetics. As I say, all these things have been absorbed into the practice of art and I don't think anybody, however much bad art there still is, I don't think anybody can say um, that we haven't come a long way since year zero in 1972. The trouble is, the trouble is, this is never settled. Um, in spite of all the, this proliferation of good practices, um, it still remains as contested and as problematic as ever it was. It tells us something, I think, when one of the leading world practitioners of public art um, it makes a statement about Anish Kapoor. I think we're totally public sculpture mad. I hate public sculpture. Oh, God, even the phrase makes me feel tired. Now, a lot of people would argue, and I have a certain sympathy with this view, that Anish Kapoor is actually a serious part of the problem himself. I mean, look at the orbital thing that he's doing outside the Olympic Games. I mean, this, this is corporate megalomania um, dressed up under the spurious um, uh, manufactured popularity of the Olympic Games. Anyway, we'll leave that aside. The trouble is, he's got a point. I've got a lot of sympathy with this guy. There is a lot of bad public sculpture being made today. I, if, if anything, it's worse than ever it was. Um, and uh, we need, if, if this is the kind of thing that uh, Anish Kapoor was referring to, then we really do have a problem on our hands. Now, experiences differ from di in different parts of the world. This is certainly how it seems from where I am, uh, which is a place called Scotland, a small, not quite independent country, not, not yet, um, slightly isolated on the geographical fringe of Europe. We like to think very much connected to Europe um, culturally. So what I'm going to do is just show a few um, examples of what I see as progressive practice that have happened over the last 20, 25 years um, in Scotland and if I don't run out of time um, I'll offer you a candid I hope assessment of the contribution that we've made to this plethora of bad practice that seems to be taking over um, in, in the public sphere. First of all I'm afraid we're going to have to do a little bit of history. There's your man on the horse. Uh, we've got one. We've got, to, we've got plenty. Uh, right on cue. <laughs> Waiting in the stables all this time. Um, uh, Glasgow is a major post-industrial city with a long, long history and a well-established tradition of art in public spaces. Most of it taking the form of that monumental tradition that Lawrence Alloway said was killed off um, by modernism. You're going to read a lot of our history through this problematic history, you might say, but it's there on public display. All the kind of key events 
events, the Battle of Waterloo, with, if you just look on the left, a little, little unit of Royal Scots Guards uh, defending the Empire on there from, from Scotland um, and uh, the Duke of Wellington. All the movers and shakers, the heroes, the politicians, the, um, the, the uh, military men and so on, they're all there. There's reminders of our contribution to the history of science and technology, James Watt, people like that, and of course the important contribution we made to the invention of modern medicine, something that we can all, I think, be grateful for, um, and of course our contribution to um, literature. So here's a couple of examples, specimen examples of literary heroes um, in uh, Glasgow. This is the kind of thing that conforms to Baudelaire's uh, definition of, of public sculpture, does it not? The idea, what is it, he calls it the sacred, the sacred function of art. It enables us to raise our eyes to something higher than ourselves and give us a sense of what we can aspire to um, as creative um, human beings. And uh, so that fits very well um, with that. Um, there is a problem here, however. The, as I say, this is, this is the great tradition um, that was killed off, according to Lawrence Alloway. And what it's also killed off um, is a certain amount of, I don't know, kind of respect or deference for this kind of um, object. And what modernism taught us to do was to be very suspicious of the kind of ideological baggage that comes with works like this. They're fallocentric, they're authoritarian looking, they look down on us um, from above. And we've learned to, to question these things. All of these things are inconsistent with contemporary ideals of, uh, of, of democratic life um, in, in a city. Now, these arguments are not to be dismissed lightly. I think this is an important critique of this kind of thing, the kind of ideological values that they bring with them. But there's one aspect of this kind of work that is usually misunderstood by most people. Um, they assume, and I'm afraid, um, Jimmy, you asked the question, who put the, the man on the horse there? Was it the city fathers? Well, um, in Scotland, the answer to that was no. It never was the city fathers at all. Politicians, government, local authority agencies never made any contribution whatsoever. They were paid for by the public themselves. Now, if you look at the way people went wild when these things were... This was one of the great forms of popular entertainment in the 19th century. When Robert Burns' statue was inaugurated, 30,000 people turned up there, and this was part of a two-day celebration across the city, a two-day um, public holiday. Now, why did they go wild? I'll tell you, because they paid for it themselves. These are always raided by public subscription. If people didn't put their hand in their pocket to hand over what they could afford, maybe it was like the 10% tax, voluntary tax that we heard about um, this morning, these things would never have happened at all. This is a particularly good example because the subscription here was called a shilling subscription. That was the maximum anybody was allowed to contribute. A shilling today, I don't know, four or five euros, not much more than a copy, the cost of a copy of a big issue. So so even the poorest people had some sense of enfranchisement in the creation um, of this work. I've seen, I've seen the, um, the list, the subscription list for the National Monument to William Wallace just outside Stirling, and it's six pages in close type published in the, the local newspaper, and the, the contributors are listed not alphabetically but according to the size of their contribution. At the top, there's the Duke of Buccleuch, 100 guineas. At the bottom, there's a Morag McTavish, brackets, recently widowed, a farthing. The smallest coin in circulation, all she could afford. So by that gesture of putting money towards this, she had as much ownership as the Duke of Buccleuch. Now, in the case of the Robert Burns, a shilling was put as the ceiling there, so nobody would feel deterred if they didn't have much money. Now, it cost £2,000 to erect. Shilling, there are 20 shillings in the pound. That's at least 40,000 people gave their consent to this by giving money towards it. So they were raised there, not by authority, but by consensus. If you ask, why are these monuments in our public spaces? The answer is because the public, as defined in the 19th century, the public wanted them to be there. The reason I'm making such a big deal out of this is because it leads to the question, and it's very pertinent to some of the things that we've heard earlier on um, this morning, is that kind of consensus possible today? I'm sure it is, but in my experience, much, much more difficult to achieve. Here's a case in point. This is a, a recent statue in Glasgow called La Passionaria. And it's a monument to Dolores Ibaruri, um, the great firebrand um, leader of the Spanish um, Civil War. And it was erected um, to pay tribute to the, by, by the International Brigade to pay tribute to the 2,100 British volunteers, mostly without any military training, that went over there uh, to join uh, Dolores in the struggle against um, fascism. So this is, I, I, and I'm, I'm just letting, letting you kind of absorb the appearance of the work there so you can see how poor it is. 
as a work of art, because this is surely is a classic example of this, what, what Benjamin is talking about. Um, a correct political tendency, uh, read the inscription there, better to die on your feet uh, than to live forever on your knees. Who on the left could quarrel with that? So, correct political tendency, but of work of quite alarming aesthetic crudity. Cheaply and shoddily made out of fiberglass. Um, it is a really very, very poor work of work. Now, the reason I raise this is because it actually sparked rather controversy at the time. Um, Glasgow, politics in Glasgow has always been kind of polarised between Tory and the left and the right. The Tory and the Labour Party, it's always been a Labour administration, so the Tories have always been kind of out in the cold. Um, the the, the Labour Party contributed to this, they supported it by giving consent for the site and also made a small contribution to the costs of the erection of it as well. But the Tories were up in arms. They hated the thing, and they, here's a few quotes from them. They described it as inartistic lump of graffiti. Don't know what that means, but it's clearly meant to be an insult. Um, a poisonous <laughs> old brute. And the leader, the leader of the Tory group, and this is what, what Jimmy was saying about you, the, the leader of the Tory group says, you know, when we come back to power, <laughs> and dream on, hasn't happened yet, and never will, but when we come back to they, they can make promises like this, the first thing we'll do on day one, we'll knock it down and throw it in the River Clyde. <laughs> now, the point, the, the, the question I want to ask is this, would that have been such a plausible option if it had been an exquisitely made object, beautifully crafted uh, and made of the finest, most expensive foundry bronze? No, they wouldn't. It would have been kind of sacred, but because it's so bad. Now, this, the, the important thing here is that they hated the politics, but they attacked it under cover of its aesthetic deficiencies. So um, its failings as a work of art gives them exactly the kind of camouflage that they need to be able to do that. Okay, so that's a good example um, of that. The trouble is, that's figure sculpture. Here's another one. Um, the figure sculpture, what's so funny about that? Why are you laughing? Okay, well, tell me later. Um, the problem with figure sculpture is it's very limited. If you think of sculpture as being some kind of vehicle for a political proposition, then this is a very, very blunt instrument um, indeed. The, its posture, the, the kind of mode of address to the public is not so much discursive as declamatory. You know, I'm telling you what is what. So we've got to be very careful about um, what these things can do. There are one or two artists in Glasgow today who still feel that there's life in the old dog yet, that you can still get some relevant uh, work out of, the, out of the figure. Like this one by a guy called Kenny Hunter called Citizen um, Firefighter. It's connecting to the great tradition, the monumental tradition, but it's not a portrait of an individual. So it's different from the commemorative structures like Burns and Scott um, and so on. So it's a kind of way of saluting a profession who would, would be actually insane if we didn't support. These are people that save people's lives by putting out fires that are usually started by our carelessness. But he goes beyond that. He calls it citizen firefighter, as if he's presenting this as a kind of paradigm of what it means today to be a responsible citizen. Can you not hear me? Can you now? You can. It doesn't sound any different to me. Five minutes. I'm done. <laughs> I can't do that. I'll stop there. Give it ten. Give it, make it ten. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, you, you Germans are so generous <laughs> with your time. I was just thinking, you know, I'm listening to, to Herman there, and uh, you Germans with all your theory. You know, I, you know I, I'm, I'm just a good old fashioned British empiricist. You know, um, this, I, I'm concerned with what's there rather than the abstract. Domain. Anyway, look, okay, I'll show you some more examples. Um, they, these, are guys, these are guys who've tried to get away from that kind of paradigm and they, they, uh, Douglas Gordon does it um, by disguising the work as something else. It kind of filters into, into the city. I'm just showing these um, few examples of good practice. Um, you can walk past that and not know um, that there's something wrong with a hotel sign attached to the back of a bank. Uh, with no, um, because if you see, you notice that the lettering is reversed um, and, and uh, it becomes correct when you see it in the polished metal plate behind it. It's a clue that the reference here is to the movies, another kind of silver screen where illusion and reality trade places with each other. But the main thing here is that this is not declamatory. Um, this is infiltrating itself into the fabric of the city itself. There's lo so much more to say about that, but I haven't got time. Um, here's another, I think another interesting possibility here is the idea of what I call hit and run art, the works outside the framework of commissioning uh, and so on where artists work on their own initiative and that gives them much more nimbleness intellectual and artistic uh, nimbleness and also often the work with a, a much more subversive edge 
This is by an old colleague of mine, uh, Ross Bill, and I bumped into him in the, um, in the corridor of the school. I was leaving with him, he was coming. He said, oh, by the way, Ray, I've privatised Kelvin Grove Park. I said, Ross, what are you talking about? He says, go and have a look. So I went up there, and there it was. He built this little enclosure in the middle of a public park in the west end of Glasgow and put the word private in the middle. Just left it there for people, any passerby, to figure out for themselves how come this arbitrary little patch of ground has been designated as private within the larger context of a public um, park. So as I say, I'm hit and runner. I think it's more than just a visual gag. I think it, it really genuinely forces us for a moment to think about the relationship between private and public. Also, what that guy was saying this morning about common, common land as well. That's a reference to the Enclosures Acts of the, of the 18th century, where common land was fenced off and ordinary people were no longer allowed access to them. Private, public, common, who has the authority to decide which is which. Now, it comes back to this idea of discourse because we're all familiar with, the, with Michel de Seto's notion that our experience of the city is like a narrative. We walk through the city, we make up our own story about it. Here's one of those moments where the story suddenly takes an unexpected um, turn. It's what I call thickening the plot. Here's another uh, example. We've moved on to time-based work because that was a temporary work. You've got the, the council moved in about two hours and took it away. The swiftness of their action um, was seen by Ross Birrell as a mark of its success, and quite rightly as well. Time-based as well, and this is to show that time-based work doesn't have to be inconsistent with the idea of the monumental. So work by a man called George Wiley. And it's called the straw locomotive, and what you see there is a wire and straw, exact scale replica of one of the great steam locomotives that we used to make in such abundance in Glasgow. We were the world leaders in this, as we were with shipbuilding, until Margaret Thatcher came along and her Tory administration of the 1980s, with the absolutely poisonous vindictiveness destroyed those industries um, for us, doing untold social and economic harm uh, to, to the city. So this is George Wiley's response to that. The important thing here is that the work is not the sculptural object you see there. The work is the entire process through which he collaborated... Oh, sorry, we're going the wrong way. Collaborated um, with a group of redundant welders and uh, steel workers from the Hyde Park Works in Springburn where these were made. The process through which the finished work was paraded through the streets of Glasgow, as they always used to be. Whenever one of these locomotives was finished, it went on a big parade through the city, all the way down to um, the Great Crane on the, on the banks of the River Clyde. It was hoisted up and then lowered into a cargo ship and sent all over the world. This one was going nowhere. It was left there, it's hoisted up, left to dangle for a week. A visible reminder seen from all over, um, all over Glasgow. A metaphor and powerful reminder of the way the heavy industries of, of Glasgow had been hung out to dry by that Tory administration. Uh, and then it was brought down, set ablaze, and 20 minutes later, just a carcass with George Wiley's calling card in the middle, a uh, question mark. So this is, not, this is sculpture, not as an object, but sculpture as a question. And it's a question that we in Scotland are still struggling to answer. George Wiley is very special to us. Um, he's the grand old man of Scottish public art, and we're celebrating his 90th year uh, this year, and something like his 60th year to his contribution to Scottish culture. He calls himself a sculptor, with a P replaced by a question mark. We call him our wise man. Oh, sorry. Keep, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you, shall I repeat that? Uh, sculptor, he's our, he's our wise man. George Wiley, 90 this year. Um, you can find him, there's a website where you can find it. You can sign up as one of his chums if you um, support him. The trouble with George is that he's done some really, truly excellent, excellent work, but he's done some very, very bad work as well. Uh, like this, this sculpture clock. Um, how's that for a bit of time-based work? Ha, ha, ha. Um, this, is, this was um, commissioned by a local radio station and it's in a very prominent place in Glasgow and I would challenge anybody here to show me a piece of public art anywhere in the world that is more puerile in its conception, more graceless in its aesthetic form or more cack-handed in the way that it's been constructed. As you can see, it doesn't even work as a clock. Two different times there. And for something that's outside the central bus station, this is a bad idea. A clock that doesn't work, a clock that doesn't work is a singularly useless object. A clock that doesn't work outside a bus station is a dangerously useless object. 
Now here, we've got a problem. Okay, he does good work, he does bad work. We all do. Every artist is inconsistent. You've got a right to do bad work when you can. But if we do it in the studio, nobody's going to bother. Put it in the public domain, it's a different matter altogether. There has to be some kind of regulatory process through which either substandard work or inappropriate work is filtered out and doesn't get a chance to infect our public spaces um, in this way. This is not just an artistic failure, this is a failure of management. Now if it's only one, if it's just a rogue example of bad work, okay, we could live with that. The trouble is, there's been a proliferation of them recently in Glasgow. I showed you one um, at the beginning. Um, but the, the, city, the city council has recently invested hundreds of millions of pounds in regenerating the waterfront, and the results are absolutely magnificent. Finish. Thank you. Uh, that's a bad note to finish. Well, you can do it later on. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you in particular, Jimmy and uh, Helmut and Ray. And uh, I guess that this panel did its job uh, to say that there is no public space and there is hardly any public art. So thank you so much. (laughs)